Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel for the value of fan fiction. Uh, I'm your moderator, Daryl Hahn. And uh, first, let's just let everyone introduce themselves. Uh, start with uh, Justine. Hi, I'm Justine Manzano. I am a YA author. I um, have written fantasy and uh, contemporary fiction. Uh, I've written the Keys and Guardian series. I am also a um, a board on the board here at Right Hive, and um, and an avid fan fiction reader and geek. Great, uh, XM. Uh, hi, I am XM Moon, or just regular Moon. <laughs> um, I have written um, a couple of novellas and published in a couple of anthologies. Um, but before that, as we're going to talk about, I had a fairly lengthy history writing fan fiction. Um, Excellent. Uh, Moniza? Hi, um, I'm Moniza, and I write picture books as well as middle grade novels. I am a huge fan of fan fiction. I love reading them. And most of what I write is inspired by stuff that I've read. So in some way or other, it is all fan fiction. Great. Quillful? Uh, I have been uh, writing fan fiction since 2019. I do write original content and I've been writing original content longer than that. Uh, I'm an inclusive gender fluid writer and uh, the more the universe tries to tell people that they can't be who they are, the more trans characters I shove into my fan fiction with the maximum spite and inclusivity. Um, that's kind of my whole angle. <laughs> so that's what I do. And uh, Rosie. Uh, that's amazing. I love that quote. Cool. Um, I think you got a lot of nods from other people who agree and also do the same, like myself. Um, <laughs> So I write young adult science fiction and fantasy, um, author of Tarnished Are the Stars and Fire Becomes Her. And uh, most recently, um, I have had a book out that is an IP novel, which is actually professional fan fiction. So technically, I'm a professional fan fiction author, um, but I'm also a hobbyist and write plenty of fanfic uh, that I just post for fun. All right. That, that's great. I'm surrounded by uh, too much talent. Um, uh, so we'll start with our opening question of what is fan fiction and why is it necessary to define or defend its value and tying close into that, what misconceptions or stereotypes surround fan fiction as an art form? Uh, we'll go in the same order. Uh, Justine? Um, well, to me, fan fiction is an incredible outlet. Um, when we experience a piece of media, we're all going to have things that we wish gone a different way. Um, whether it be the plot or like that the plot was missing something we wanted, the plot went in a direction that frustrated us, um, characters didn't have time to explore things we wanted them to explore because of pacing, or we wanted to explore a character's internal thoughts further. Um, it just gives the audience the ability to explore the things that about media that we love, while also getting to fiddle with those things that we don't um, and, and jump in and kind of muss up the the puddle uh, it also gives the readers a place to find those things so when when we dive in yeah i don't know about the rest of you but when i've seen something that i love and i want to see more of the characters and i want to try to find like oh i wish i'd seen these two characters interact more I, that's where i go i'm like next step is archive of our own and i'm looking things up um I think that the issues around fanfic and the reason why a lot of times it's looked down on is people think that it's poorly written, which is because it's written by anybody, um, anybody. It's, it's a completely open and free exploration. Um, and I, it can be also a lot of people think it's just porn, which is not necessarily downing on the porn, um, but it is. Like, you know, a lot of times if you say, oh, I'm reading fan fiction, they'll be like, oh, should you be reading that in public? Like, people are weird like that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I I think also, like, while there's, when whenever there's an open and free exploration of art, there's always going to be some that isn't so great because just anyone can, can write it. Um, that's kind of the beauty of it, though, is that anyone can. Um, but there's also some really talented authors, um, as we see people who are, you know, destined to to publish bigger original work, um, and some that just do it for fun, but are extremely talented. And, um, you know, some of that is porn too, but whatever. Uh, we're not prudes here, so. <laughs> 
So, Justine, I'm actually really glad that you mentioned the uh, the things that we wish we could change about canon, because I was recently exposed to the term faux fiction, um, you know, fan fiction for things that you love and want to make more of, and there's faux fiction for things that you hate everything the original creator chose to do with it, but you got to fix it. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I think, like you mentioned, they're both phenomenal ways to explore things that you already have a framework for. Um, it's, it's a sandbox to play in, whether it's that you want to expand on the existing content or completely change it because you, you know, you see additional stories or you see better stories, you know, you, you see things that, that could have happened and didn't. Um, yeah, I think, so there's definitely the, the misconception that fanfic is poorly written. I've read some of the best writing I've ever encountered in fan fiction and some of the worst writing I've ever encountered in six figure book deals. Um, so I think that's definitely not the case. Um, there's also this idea that writing fan fiction is lazy or that it's easier. And I will die on both of those hills as well. Um, it's not. And people are really mean to you when you write fan fiction because everyone has ideas about how you should have written. Wow. Okay, how you should have written, <laughs> um, you know, this this piece of media that you chose to put out into the world. Um, then there's also the idea that it's stealing, that you're cheapening the original media, and I fundamentally disagree with those as well. Yeah. So, um, in terms of what is fan fiction, um, so it, have you guys read um, on fairy stories by Tolkien? That essay that he wrote that's so wonderful. Um, so in that essay, he talks about this thing called a cauldron of story which is basically this like um, pot where every single thing ever written exists and goes into. And um, as a writer, you kind of dip in and you take out various things and whatever serves your purposes, you kind of repurpose in your story. So, you know, some things that exist in this cauldron include the Arthurian legends, things like that. And uh, they keep coming up again and again in various forms. So I do think that most fiction is fan fiction to a certain extent. Um, because it's derivative in some way or other because you're inspired by something. Um, yeah, so I think it's hard to define what exactly is fan fiction. Shakespeare was writing fan fiction, you know, like Hamlet is fan fiction, Romeo and Juliet is fan fiction. It's just, it's, just, um, it's bigger than people think it is. Um, it's older than people think it is. Um, and I think the tendency to be inspired by fiction and then to write because you have been inspired um, I think that is just an older impulse than people realize. It's not just a new thing because of the internet. Um, I think what the internet has done is it has allowed fan fiction to be just a lot more accessible as um, to both readers as well as to writers. So more people can write and share, which wasn't the case in, before. Um, yeah, in terms of what are some misconceptions about fan fiction, I think people think that it's written and consumed by the very young. Um, that's one. And I don't, I know that's not true because um, a lot of people my age grew up reading it and writing it and we're still doing it. So that's one. Um, it's true that a lot of people also think that fan fiction is smut. Um, I personally prefer the fan fiction that's not very smutty, though I, I would never judge anyone for reading or writing smut. But um, there's a lot of fan fiction that is just an exploration of a world that you um, became obsessed with because it was just so uh, wonderful. And that is literally just, you know, world building. And then there's a lot of fan fiction that's just characterization work because you're fixated on a character and you want to explore that character. And sometimes that's mutt. And sometimes it's just that character, you know, having a normal day and just hanging out with their friends. So yeah, um, yeah, I think the smut thing is a big mis misconception that it's badly written is another one. Um, I agree completely with Moon that um, some of the best some of the best writing I've ever read was fan fiction. And I have read very, very, very bad um, published fiction. So, you know, there's bad writing everywhere and there's good writing everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I would say one of my, for me, just going out of the gate, one of the things that I love most about fan fiction is that you can explore things that you couldn't get into in canon. Like there's, to have a tight narrative that works you're not going to be able to explore every character, every facet, every part of the world that the fandom wishes there was more of. And that's where fan fiction comes in, is that you can flesh out these things and not have to worry about 
that central plot because you're just talking about this concept or this character or this relationship. And that's one of the things that I personally love about it. Um, of course, as we've all said at this point, uh, one of the heaviest misconceptions is that the issue with quality because there's no QA. But because there's no one, like, yeah, you might have a beta reader, but because there's not like a marketing team saying like, this main character can't be a man or can't be a woman or there shouldn't be a single father or whatever weird conception they have because they just want to sell, sell, sell. That's their job. Everyone but the writer, that's what they're focused on. You get these stories that are just slowly filtered out of all their spirit and soul. Now, have I loved New York best-selling stories? Of course, but there is something distinctly individual about fan fiction because it hasn't been put through the ringer. Now, does this also turn around and say, well, yeah, you're going to have, they're using the wrong your, there's a typo here, there's a word missing there. Yes, I would deal with that for the rest of my life if I meant that I could continue reading stories that weren't beaten into submission for marketability. And that's really what I turn to fan fiction for is I'm not, I'm not here to have something that's palatable and inoffensive. Uh, I would love to have something that pushes me and explores more. And I go like, wow, I've never seen anything like this. Even if I'm odd or horrified or both, <laughs> I would rather have that experience than just stay within the set lines by the publishing industry. That sounds like the bad place to me. That's that's where we're going with that. <laughs> Yeah, um, I agree with everything you've all said. I feel like I don't have a whole lot to contribute other than um, just to say that I think what's really interesting about fan fiction is that it isn't gate kept the same way that, uh, you know, original fiction is. And I think that that creates um, a really magical place for creativity and exploration of works, but also of self. And I think that's really cool. Um, you know, I, I, I also want to add on that, you know, we're talking about the importance of defining fan fiction. And I actually think that it's important in many ways not to define fan fiction, because I think that defining it puts barriers on it. And there are places where it's important to define, for example, um, legally, I think it's very important to define fan fiction. I think it's important to have those definitions in place to protect authors' um, interests and intellectual property and things like that. But I think on the larger scale, um, defining it as something specific often does not allow for transformation of a form. And I think that that's what fan fiction is all about, about transformation. Um, it's in conversation with an original work, transforming it into something else. We see this with the different types of fan fiction that we see. We see modern AUs, we see coffee shop AUs, we see, um, you know, like a pirate AUs, we see all kinds of different um stories that really are transformative they take characters from one world and put them in another and you could almost say that that's original at, at some point but the author is choosing to say no this is a fan work no this is um in conversation with something else and i think that that's really powerful and cool so i i think that's there, there is an argument to be made for um avoiding any sort of rigid definition because there's so much to explore within fan fiction that's a a, a point I would have never thought of. Right. So, Imagine Rosie starting like, oh, I don't think I have anything to contribute. And then she just blows the whole thing. <laughs> right, right. Um, the, the, since you brought up, you know, uh, intellectual property issues, that ties into the next question. So let's have you uh, keep going, Rosie, uh, with what sort of intellectual property issues arise with fan fiction and what issues are unique to written derivative works as opposed to visual works such as fan art? Um, I guess that's a really interesting question. I, I won't say that I have any particular expertise when it comes to the difference between fan art and fan fiction. I, okay. I will say that there is a really interesting difference in terms of creator reaction. And I experience it myself as an author. Um, if someone tags me in fan art of my work, it's like this huge celebration that I get to have. And I just feel like, wow, look at how cool this is, this thing that I can't do because I'm not an artist. But if someone writes fan fiction of my work, I am legally, uh, it is a legal gray area for me to even acknowledge its existence. 
Um, in some ways, it is legally uh, a great area for me to be on this panel saying that I read fan fiction at all. I am legally barred from reading the fan fiction of the work that I am engaging with in an IP manner. So I can't go and read any sort of like Life is Strange fan fiction despite being the author of the official Life is Strange book. And it's because I have to avoid any sort of, you know, concern that I have stolen something from a fan and created it and then sold it for money. And I think that that's like, uh, simultaneously very prohibitive and also uh, potentially good because it is protecting the fan creator's content as if it has, you know, that same sort of value and that same sort of um, importance as something that is original fiction. I don't want to steal something from a fan. I, do, I don't want to be that person and I don't think anyone should be. I think those works, despite being in conversation with something that has been published and copywritten are still like, it's still plagiarism. It can steal something from them. So I do think that those kind of rules exist for a reason, but um, it is, it is prohibitive. And I think it's, um, it's kind of sad for me that I can't go looking for those things and celebrate the basis as well. Um, obviously, you know, there's a lot of different concerns legally when it comes to fan fiction and licensing and how that works. But um, there are people who are smarter about it than I am who will probably have more to say. I know there's a long history with um, litigation from like Warner Bros. Um, had some, some things to say for sure uh, back in like the early 2000s when Harry Potter fan fiction was taking off. And that really, I think, was a huge kind of like watershed moment for fan fiction when they backed down and didn't pursue uh, legal action. And so it's, you know, there's there's a lot to be said in there and there's a lot of history that I don't know. So if anyone else has more to say about that, they should. But uh, yeah, um, I think that there's a really interesting difference there with what we as writers of original work are allowed to do with fan art versus fan fiction of our own creation. Okay, wow. Uh, Quilful, do you want to carry on from there? Sure, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, honestly, um, on Archive of Our Own is where I post a lot of my fan fiction and their system is very transparent as far as like what is and is not allowed legally for fan fiction. Uh, and most of it's just because like technically, of course, the world, the lore, the magic, the science, the characters were all made by someone else. So if you're making a profit off of that, it's considered a violation of their intellectual property and you're going to get into an issue there. That's why you can't link directly to anything where you might make money off of archive or around. But you'll go on Twitter and you'll see someone share their fanfic and say, if you liked it, you can tip me here. Uh, it's because they're not on archive of our own. Uh, that's another gray area kind of situation where like to be the safest you possibly can be, don't make any money off of your fan fiction. But you know there are cover bands that get tips in subways, you know what I mean? Like cover artists playing music that's not theirs and they're getting money. No one is gonna come after someone for that because it's $12. So like, it's just not worth it. Versus if you are selling books, if you're selling merchandise, that's when you start to get into trouble because you are impacting their sales. And that's really what our cup of our own hinges their arguments on legally is they're like, there's you weren't making this, you weren't writing this, so it's not taking from your sales because look me in the eyes and tell me you're gonna write a werewolf Star Wars movie. Tell me, lie to me. So like, that's really where fan fiction kind of can function because they're not infringing on the potential sales of something that the original creator has made. So that's where kind of, they try to keep it for legal purposes. Uh, and of course, as I said, I know there are people who bend the rules and they get tips, but again, they're, prob they're probably gonna be fine because it's not a substantial amount of money and it's not something that's consistently generating vast amounts of income like book sales, like things like that. So that's been my understanding through being on Archive of Our Own, but we have many more hosts to tell us more things. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know if I have anything to add to this, but I've never thought of um, fanfic writers kind of like cover, mu cover band musicians. That makes so much sense because we do tip them 
Um, I don't think I've ever tipped um, a fanfic writer because um, I read on AO3 and you're right, they don't send you any links to anywhere you can give them money. Though like sometimes I've read a writer and I've liked the writer so much, I'm just like in the comments, like, do you have original fiction? I will read everything that you have written. I will read it all. I, I want to give you some money. But yeah, um, in terms of I think AO3 is interesting because of the history of its foundation as well, because AO3 was founded because of litigious writers like Anne Rice and um, who went after fanfiction.net and just caused a mass exodus of fic fan fiction, fan fiction writers who needed a safe uh, place where they could share their work. And I think AO3 is interesting because they have lawyers, like they are lawyered up. So um, if um, even Marvel were to come after them, like they have people who can help defend the writers who post on there. And I think that's just such a wonderful thing about fan fiction that, and I think that's a wonderful thing about fan fiction, having older fans, because I think this is something that older fans can do where they can create a website and actually have the legal know-how where they can make it safe for everyone legally and also to give um, fans the guidelines to as to how you can legally share derivative work without getting into trouble or infringing on someone else's copyrights. Yeah, um, yeah, a huge fan of AO3, love it. Yeah, I mean, everyone's kind of gotten into the fact that you you don't own the IP. Um, that's, that's the biggest thing. And the fun flip side of that with AO3 is that their legal protections for derivative works actually don't extend to original works, um, which is what I'm always explaining to people. So it's funny because like both Rosie and Quilfla brought up some really cool points that I, I hadn't really thought of both the cover band thing and then the, the protections against authors reading derivative content of their works for the the fan writers. Um, and I think I think the system that we have in place now is phenomenal. Um, I started out in the dark er ages, um, fanfiction.net and live journal. <laughs> Um, I, I wasn't quite the, uh, the paper copy era as much, but I remember, um, I remember the time of citrus fruits and no tagging system. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, so it's, it's been really cool to see the way things have changed. Um, and all the great phenomenal things that are being done now that Anne Rice is no longer around to fight them. <laughs> um, because that's, you know, that's when people talk about intellectual property and fan fiction, that's, that's the one that comes to mind for me. Um, and that's where, you know, we're talking about what fan fiction is. Well, it's, it's when the author doesn't understand that she's writing gay vampires. Like, <laughs> that's when and why we have fan fiction um, is, is, you know, sometimes things just slip through the cracks and someone's got to fix it. And it's okay. It's an act of love. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I think, Honestly, everyone's kind of hit the the big points on the head really well, but yeah, I think we've we've come to such a cool point now where we have this phenomenal archive um, that is dedicated to keeping an archive, and that's that's incredible to me that it's in pretty much entirely volunteer staffed and maintained is incredible to me because that tells me that there's not just thousands of people wanting to make derivative works out of love, but there's just as many people with incredible skill sets to protect that. Um, I have two points. One is that I think it's incredibly fun to watch when Archive of Our Own um, does their fundraisers and um, they do this so that they can keep up those legal protections and their servers and things like that. And it's always really fun to watch how fast they earn out their requested um, amount um, because this is like for for so many of us this is something we love and we will pay it to keep it alive even though we're not going to pay the authors because of the IP situation we'll pay to keep them protected um, which I think is just an incredible show of of how supportive and uniting fandom is in general. Um, but also I kind of wanted to make a point that sort of floats out of the, the legal area, um, because 50 shades of gray, <laughs> I mean, literally everybody knows that it's a fan fiction of twilight, uh, or that's where it started. And 
it's, I think it's very interesting that it's so open and that it's supported and no legal action was taken at all. And I don't disagree with that choice because I think that the altered universe is so different um, that it does feel like a totally different story. Whether that story is good or bad or the original story is good or bad is something else entirely, but um, it does definitely give you an entirely different feeling. And I just think it's, I don't have an answer there as to how that survived without any issue or, um, you know, just because we all know that we live in a world where people just really get so happy. And um, I'm honestly surprised that no company went, hey, but wait, uh, over, over the Twilight thing. But um, I think it is an interesting movement. Um, whether or not you can take a fan fiction and file off the serial numbers and make it something completely different um, is a, f a fun place to play. I won't say that I've never um, taken something that was purely an idea, because that would be a lie. Um, my book series originally started as a Buffy the Vampire Slayer fanfic that I never published. And, um, and just... I, after a while, I realized that it wasn't anymore. I kept changing things and it it's so far away that it's nowhere near it now, except that there are teenagers fighting monsters. That's the only common thing. Um, and a strong female protagonist. That's it. Um, but I think it's interesting to see where that line continues to, to travel as far as how open the idea of fanfic uh, turning into new things Um travels in the future well on to the next question then uh in what ways does fan fiction help a writer write original fiction that kind of touches on what you were just talking about in what ways is it less helpful i.e what good writing habits does fan fiction help cultivate and what bad writing habits can fan fiction lead to if an author isn't careful since since you were just talking about how you went from fan fiction to original work why don't you uh, lead off on that one justine Sure. Um, so for me, I took lessons from a couple of lessons from fan fiction, um, which I cut my teeth on when, you know, in the very early, the first thing I published um, ever was a fanfic. And it was the thing that gave me confidence to actually put my work out there, uh, my original work out there. Um, because before that, I wasn't sure I was much of a writer. Um, and then I got like, some praise and it built me up. And then I kept getting some praise and I was like, oh wait, maybe there's a career here. Um, not in fan fiction, but in, you know, in actual, like in, in original writing. Um, so I think the first thing that I learned or that I got to play with, because that's what I was using fan fiction for. I was like, I like this story. I want to see it from this point of view. And I want to make that point of view messy. I want to make it unreliable. I want to like all the things that I would want to do in like my, in like my original fiction, I was like, how, how can I do that? And can I do it right? And so I would take a fan fiction story uh, that I wanted to see more of, and I would try it in a like open forum where people will give me feedback and I don't have to be worried about whether or not it'll be approved of or not. And and would get feedback on it and would go, oh, okay, all right. So I, I do know how to do that. Or, okay, so I, you know, this still, this still works. Like uh, people can understand what I'm doing here. And so I teach myself little things about how to play with point of view and rely reliability of narrators and how people, how characters experience things um, differently from the characters around them. I learned so much about that playing with different fanfics. Um, and just going, this time I'm going to take it from this, this point of view. Um, and just, just messing with it. Um, I think that um, it helps you, fan fiction, to work within a set character and understand that character and their traits and not, if you want to stay in character, you're going to, you're not going to bend them. So you're going to find the way to not, you know, if a character does have rough edges, and you tend towards really nice 
people, or if your, your natural reaction would be something very nice, I have this problem. I tend to be too soft uh, with people. And so when I'm writing fanfic and I'm writing a rough character, I have to be like, no, 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 they wouldn't that character wouldn't respond that way. They would respond with this snarky comeback. And it that change, the having to come up with that naturally, because that's what the character would do. Um, that was taught to me by fanfic too. It was like, oh, well, I already know this character and this character is this way. How would they respond? And then from there, I started to draw out and make my own characters and look at their traits and be able to like answer in their voices. Um, so all of those things were really a lot of fun to play with and um, really taught me a lot. As far as hindering, I think um, because fan fiction allows for just everything under the sun um, and that the community is the way it is. Like I know personally, I got very used to instant gratification and a reaction on every chapter and knowing if people were enjoying what I was doing and if I should continue going in that direction, that's gone when you're writing original thick, unless you're doing serial work. Um, I think that also something that I, I struggle, I find that people struggle with that I, I talk to is this, um, the idea of like the length and breadth of the story in fanfic can be like anything you have drabbles and, you know, hundred word drabbles, and then you have like one shots and you have epic multi-chapter series stories and um then in publishing you have eighty-five thousand words or they're not going to sign it um so it's like it's a hard thing to like learn to write within a different set of boundaries all i'll say all that is i'm trying to learn everything that you've already learned so uh carrying on uh xm <laughs> um I think Justine actually kind of set me up for half my thoughts on this. So thanks. <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I think it, so people talk about writing being like a muscle all the time. And I, I do fundamentally agree with that. Um, I think regardless of whether it's where you start and your entire career, something you do on the side, fan fiction is a great place to build that skill set. Um, again, it doesn't matter what you're doing with it because you're, you're making words. Like it doesn't matter if you're writing half a million words of Harry Potter fan fiction, or if you're writing half a million words of original, you're writing half a million words. You're going to inevitably get better at writing through the process of writing those words. Um, and yeah, Justine touched on the, the really cool part where, especially when you're starting out, having that framework of an existing universe, existing characters that you have to try to work within the rules of, um, if you're, you know, if you're going to dedicate yourself, I guess, to doing it within those confines, um, that can be really difficult. I think way more than people realize. I published last year in a shared world anthology. And I'm like, oh, this is even harder than fan fiction <laughs> um, because you do get a little bit of leeway there. You get those those fan interpretations of characters and personalities and things like that that give you a little extra wiggle room. Um, and that's that's where, yeah, it can be a really great tool to work on those different voices, those different points of view, even different genres and story types that you you might not think you would be interested in. Um, Fanway can be a phenomenal gateway reading experience to all, all sorts of things. It, it exposes you to all sorts of things. People do the same really cool research and story building and world building they do with original work. Um, you you do have kind of the flip side though you're working with a world that everyone reading your story already knows they already know that the grumpy one isn't actually grumpy he's in love with the sunshine one and therefore like some i i see it a lot and i i've been guilty of it as well especially if you're taking a story that started out as a transformative work and you are transforming it into a fully original work um it's a nice little file on the spine um you're, you're going to run into these problems where, okay, well, they already know what this character looks like, so I don't have to spend that exposition time explaining this. They already know where this relationship is going, so I don't have to put in the same development. I can just jump right to this point of the story that I want to tell. Original fiction, you don't get to do that jump. You do it, and your, your beta readers, your writing group, your editor comes back and says, no, no, fix that. That's that's a hold. That's no. Um 
so that's that gets a little tricky um also uh blurbs and synopses i am the biggest advocate for tagging not only fan fiction but original work um i think that it started to kind of move into even traditional publishing as a thing that you do is great you can sell for lack of a better word a fanfic on tags and you know a 20 word summary um you can't do that with original work writing blurbs is miserable i hate it <laughs> is what i'm learning uh because again in in fanfic you you tag it and they already the reader already has an idea of what to expect going into the story. They already know the trajectory. It's probably more or less going to take because if you're deviating from that too hard, you're tagging for it. At least if you're following the unspoken rules of tag usage. Um, so I think that gets a little tricky because there are some some shortcuts that can become weaknesses if you aren't aware of them. But they're they're all fixable things. And again, at the end of the day, you're still you're still flexing those muscles, you're still building those skills, you're still making words, and you're still exploring stories and ideas that can help get you into writing original work if you want to. They can help, you know, build those new things that you want to make. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I, I agree with everything you just said. Uh, uh, Moniza. I think something really great that fan fiction kind of prepares you for is that Original fiction is also written in a community. And I don't know if writers um, who may not have come from a fanfic background realize that you need that kind of like um, community around you as you create. Like I write picture books um, and obviously I draft my picture books in a vacuum, but then they get you know read by other picture book writers and they give me feedback and then it gets read by my agent and um, it editors. And it's like a whole, just a whole bunch of people who are involved in the process. And I think if you write fan fiction organically, you're kind of like involved in that um, in terms of like getting access to beta readers who are already built in, who give you feedback as you write, but also like other fanfic writers um, who will give you feedback, who will, you know, read your, read your work for you and if, if you reciprocate and also do it in return. And I think that's that kind of community that fan fiction has is, is just a it's, a, it's a wonderful way to prepare yourself for writing professionally as well. And also like knowing that writing is something that you need the feedback even before it's published. Like it's something that 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 is part of the process of creating work. So that's one. Um, something I, I really like to what Justine said about how you um, kind of like get into it because you like a character and that gives you kind of like a template because you know this character. So I think fan fiction is just an amazing tool for developing your, your ability to do characterization work. Even when I'm writing original fiction, sometimes when I'm thinking of like who this character is, I'll be like, oh yeah, I know this is a child, but okay, this child is like, you know, this particular like you know, Dean Winchester. <laughs> Just to give you an idea of what kind of person this, this, this character is. Or like I'll read, you know, like a like a like something, and I'm just like, oh god, this is this is this is Buffy, you know, but but obviously it's not Buffy, but you can kind of see that this is this is the archetype that that we're working with. And fan fiction really helps you do characterization from that kind of point of view. I think characterization is done so well in fanfics. And um, that's that's something that it really helps you with. In terms of like how it hinders you as a writer, I agree with what everyone else has said um, about how um, publishing um, traditionally is, um, is, is actually, especially if you write genre fiction, it's actually quite constraining. Um, genre fiction can be quite, um, in terms of like the word count and the plot, it can be quite formulaic as well. So you need to have like a particular structure that an editor will look at and identify. If you don't have that plot structure, then they, they will may not want to take a chance on your story. And um, those of us who read fan fiction know that that's, that that's actually like not true. A, a lot of readers will love to read a book that doesn't follow that kind of like very stereotypical plot structure. Um, but Unfortunately, for better or for worse, that's what's going on in traditional publishing, especially in genre fiction. So if you write just fan fiction, you may struggle because you need to like learn that kind of like, you know, like the three act structure and how that works and how that actually looks like in, 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 a, in a published novel. And it needs to be like 85K or like, you know, now they're getting longer. So maybe 100K. 
um, it cannot be 300,000 words because <laughs> no one will publish it. And it cannot be, you know, 5K of like beautiful writing. So yeah, um, so that's, that's, I think that's a bit of a hurdle that you need to jump once you start writing uh, to, for the traditional publishing market. Honestly, uh, this probably is touching on a lot of what other people have said, but I think the best thing when you're starting with fan fiction or maybe you wrote original and you did fan fiction the way I went, the best part about it is it really helps distill your voice because you don't have to think about marketing or you know what happens if you cast too much magic or not enough magic or what happens if you shoot the laser gun too much nothing i don't know does the engine make noise in space or not like you don't have to get caught up in things like that and then you can decide what your voice is like find the things you do well if people love your villains if they think you write great romance if they love different character archetypes that you have you find the things that you're really really good at which does help you with your original fiction because you don't have the marketing budget of Lucasfilms. So <laughs> knowing what you're good at helps you start off on, on a strong foot with like advertising that. So if, if that was a transition that you wanted to make where you go from fan fiction to original fiction, it kind of gets you that leg up in knowing how that works. Uh, I will say a couple of things that can hinder you if you make that particular journey is weirdly, I think those people don't think about this a lot, uh, formatting for the screen versus a page are like two totally different things. Because uh, you can kind of get away with longer paragraphs on a page, but because your screen could be this big or this big, <laughs> you're going to go for smaller paragraphs. There's just like a lot to consider. The the tab indentation that you would see on a page that you don't see in fan fiction. It just, the list goes on and on. So it sounds silly, but if you're gonna have a print book, it's, there's a totally different set of things you have to learn. And it, this is touching on what someone said before as well, but there's so much feedback and support and community with fan fiction that when you switch to original fiction, it feels like screaming into a void, uh, which is why I have like, three original fictions and a hundred fan fictions because I am terminally addicted to the community <laughs> and that exchange. I love telling a story to someone instead of to a black hole. So there is definitely that, that struggle, but it's one of those things that I personally don't see it as like, it doesn't bother me, but I do the serial kind of structure. So I can volley back and forth between like, stories that people talk to me on and stories that people like without saying anything and still get like that engagement and that sense of community from a reader from my fan fiction while I'm simultaneously working on original fiction. I have ADHD. Does it show? Is it showing? Anyway. So <laughs> yeah, right, like, yeah. So that's, you know, it can be hit or miss. I think that's something that some people could be hindered by, but for me, it lets me volley back and forth and enjoy everything i have my cake i eat it too that's where we are oh. you get that cake okay uh rosie i mean everyone had such a good answers um so i i feel like again like i'm like everyone said everything i wanted to say but i think i'll add um with fan fiction you can kind of stretch different muscles while relaxing others so you don't have to create a whole brand new world you can write in somebody else's world and you don't have to worry about that part of storytelling. Or you can use someone else's characters and you don't have to worry about that part of storytelling. The storytelling that you're doing is, you know, maybe you're writing a drabble and it's just a, you're just thinking about a little bit of romance. Or you might be writing something that's a total AU and you're having to build a whole other world, but you're using those characters. So you get to really just, I, I think focus on one area at a time in a way that you don't often get the chance to do with original fiction. And so it's a great place to practice. Um, it's also, I think, a great place to explore things that you're not sure you want to publish. So for example, and I think for a lot of, a lot of people, um, fan fiction has been an outlet for uh, queer exploration for a lot of writers who were not ready to come out to the world or weren't ready to write queer stories that they were going to publish under their own names. They really just needed to explore that. And, you know, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, 
what do you do if you're not ready to come out, but the publishing industry is sort of forcing you to because of own voices discourse and things like that? And I think that fan fiction is an incredibly uh, good answer to that in many ways. It can allow you the freedom to explore those things before you're ready to really say what you want to say about them. And so that's that's a place where not only can you grow as a writer, but you can grow as a person in a lot of ways that I think is is interesting. And as far as hindrances, um, I'm not sure that I have really anything else other than what you've all already said, um, other than time. I think that for me, the biggest struggle is I want to write fan fiction all day long and I have to write my silly little books to make my silly little money to pay my silly little bills. And um, if I spend all my time on fan fiction, that doesn't happen. And so for a lot of us who have aspirations of writing full time or writing professionally in any way, knowing that you're using the same, basically you're using the same muscles to write fan fiction that you would to use, that you would use to write original fiction. And if you write so much fan fiction, you might get tired. And you won't be able to write the thing that's going to get you a paycheck. So really, that's that's the biggest thing for me is that that balance. Um, but I don't know if that really counts as a hindrance so much as just a me problem. Oh, same, same though. Yeah, um, you, uh, you you touched on uh, some points that are, are really in, in the next question, a uh, really next cluster of questions because they're all grouped together, but. Uh, it's uh, in what ways uh, can a writer express their creativity in a fan fiction story that they couldn't in traditional fiction uh, from fix it fix to alternative universe to the quaint cafe fix and all those and so many more. Uh, what is it that you can find acceptance for in fan fiction that traditional fiction just doesn't seem ready for and what voices do we hear in fan fiction that you just don't hear in traditional publishing nearly as much. Uh, do you want to uh, launch off from there, Rosie, since you already kind of touched on some of that? Sure. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, I mean, I really think that the thing about fan fiction is that there isn't a traditional sense of gatekeeping. We don't have editors. We don't have uh, acquisitions meetings. We don't have someone who's deciding this is marketable and this is not. Um, in many ways, fan fiction is sort of an equal opportunity feeding, feeding frenzy of like, there's not even really an algorithm, you know, with like on AO3, you're just posting. And yes, there are certain times of day where it's more advantageous to post perhaps. But to an extent, you are... Um, basically asking for a fan fiction community to judge you on your merits rather than on your promotion tactics. And I think that that is kind of special. And yes, there are still some promotion tactics that happen. You know, people will post on social media about things and whatnot. But but really, I think it is more about merit and community and conversation than traditional publishing allows stories to be. There is this sense of Fan fiction is always in conversation, either with the original work or with the fans, with the fandom. And I think that that makes it just an incredible experience for starters. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think that there is this ability to tell stories direct to the consumer rather than going through a bunch of hoops trying to get through somebody who thinks they know who the consumer is. And I think that's that's really special. So we do see a lot of stories being told that are not going to make it in the larger market because someone somewhere is going to say no. And in fan, in fan fiction, you don't have to worry about that. If someone says no, they're a hater in a comment saying no, they're not someone with the power to change your career. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is like the best way to launch into it. It was just like a beautiful opening act, if you will, because that's really what it boils down to is the thing I love with fan fiction the most. It is, it is like the most anti-censorship, anti-book banning you can possibly be. You can write things that would truly churn my stomach. But I have the freedom and the liberty as a person with eyes to not put my eyes on that. <laughs> I can just not read it. And it's my choice. I don't have to be offended that you wrote it. I don't have to be offended that you published it. I don't have to be mad that there are 72 bookmarks. It's literally none of my business. I can go find something else that I like and read that. 
And thankfully, there are millions of fix out there for me to read. So it just kind of broadens everything that a writer can express. And as someone who's also on like the trauma writer side of things, that's hugely important for people to be able to process very dark, very difficult experiences that they've had because therapy is expensive in America <laughs> and probably other places, but that's where I live. And <laughs> it's helpful to be able to get that out of your system in a way that's not actually hurting anyone contrary to what some people might say. Yes, it's dark. Yes, it's difficult. But if you can't read it, then don't. Respect your boundaries, you know, take care of yourself, curate your experience 100%. But just because it's there doesn't mean you have to read it. So that's really where I think it's super important to have that ability, not just to express your creativity, but to process things that traditional publication wouldn't just not allow, but would probably burn the manuscript while making unwavering eye contact with you. Like that's, that's probably the way that would go. And the nice thing with the different voices in fan fiction in particular is that we don't have to deal with what's acceptable, what's marketable, what's not going to ruffle any feathers. It's something that everyone truly has room on the shelf because I've heard that phrase before where like there's room on the shelf for everyone. And some publishers have tossed it around. And I was like, lie to yourself if you want, Sharon, but not me. Like, I've been to Barnes and Nobles. They have a limited amount of shelf space. <laughs> so it's a physical place. So I don't know what to tell you other than, yeah, there is only so much room on the shelf. And it does make it difficult for marginalized voices. Versus if someone is chronically ill and trans and in a poly unit and they want to write a story that reflects their personal experiences they can do that and there's no one in an overpriced suit to tell them they can't and that's one of the most beautiful things for me <laughs> about fan fiction and uh i'm a big nerd now you know it because you didn't before you're in good company if you're talking about being a nerd and that no one said Omegaverse yet, because I feel like that's the one thing that hasn't broken the seal in traditional I almost, publishing yet. I almost said it, but I didn't. And I did it just for you. I appreciate you. it. That's what I, I, after losing power out of nowhere, super, super big fan of still getting to say Omegaverse on a professional panel. <laughs> um, yeah, I, so I think, I think there are a lot of more um, taboo things that you can get in fan fiction that like I said, haven't quite broken into traditional publishing yet. They still feel a little too dangerous, a little too out there, a little too, you know, they're, they're risky when you have a marketing department. Um, when you have a lot of people whose careers and incomes depend on whether or not this really specific kind of out there kink will sell or not. Whereas fan fiction, you, you do what you want, tag it, you're good. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's kind of cool too. And I, Hopefully, well, I think you kind of touched on this some when I was getting back in the call. Um, you do get those marginalized voices. And like Rosie said, you you aren't as forced to label yourself. You don't have to put an author picture on fan fiction. People aren't going to sit there and look at this picture of you and go, oh, well, I think they're X, Y, Z and analyze you like they have your DNA for, you know, like that's not there. You get to be an icon and a weird little username on a dark little website and write whatever scary, funky little words you can. Um, so you get to explore more. You get to have that freedom to be the part of yourself that you aren't even necessarily in your, you know, group chat with your friends. Um, that kind of unfiltered version to explore things that, no, maybe you're not you're not into it. Maybe, you, you know, you, you aren't endorsing them, obviously, but you get to play with these things that you wouldn't necessarily get to otherwise. Um, and you get to explore characters and backstories and things that you wouldn't otherwise either. And that's, we kind of touched on it some of the last question, but you can take those characters and stories, you know, the, the characters that the author said, I know I can't tell this story. I know this character won't sell. And you're like, well, but I can. Um, and that they, it can expand you as an author of the storytelling and it can expand the world of what other people think original traditional storytelling can be. 
because you see these things explored in fan fiction and you say, oh, well, there, there is actually a market for this. So maybe I can take a chance and tell that story that I wouldn't have told otherwise, be it original or fan fiction. It's, um, it's a really cool testing ground, I guess, in that sense. I truly cannot believe we don't have Omega verse fiction happening in like it's wild to me that that hasn't hit yet. We do. They just don't know how to market it. It's yeah. Like, someone needs to be a little it's, less. It's just. And, it know. just seems like it's like TikTok is just waiting for this they, to hit. They think it's <laughs> not something that will sell. They are so incorrect. Clearly, this is, like just click Omega verse on Ao3. You'll see. Yeah. They think a lot of things won't sell that would. I'm fighting the urge to pull up the number of fixed tagged certain things that people are like, oh, well, no one does that. And I'm like, well, me and a thousand other dirty little freaks would say otherwise because <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> if you provide a complimentary paper cover like that has nothing on it, uh, probably, you know, <laughs> they just don't want to be seen with it. And that's fine. And that's where like we need to bring pulp back. Not every story has to be the next great literary award winner. Sometimes you just want to tell weird little stories and there's a huge benefit and market and value to those i like grocery shopping with people recognizing me not at all so i wouldn't want to be a bestseller i'm gonna be real with you no that's full respect to people who do but i it's not for me (laughs) enjoy but i'm out i will say there are maybe three best-selling authors that are recognizable in the world like, very fair by their face like you recognize john green maybe but like anyone else I wouldn't. I wouldn't be able to tell you what they look like, and I've read I all their books. I recognize Dean Koontz, but he'd have to have his dog with him. Um, yeah, exactly. I John exactly. Green yeah. from a Tumblr post, not from a. Uh... So, <laughs> uh, car- carrying King. on with the uh, with this whole cluster of questions about what you can do in fan fiction and the voices you hear in fan fiction, uh, Maniza. Just like just to add on to the Omega verse thing, I feel like this indie fiction. So people are making money writing Omega verse fiction. I may be wrong about this, but I, I feel like a lot of people are making a lot of money doing this. So, but you know, traditional publishing hasn't jumped in on it and maybe they should. It's not my thing, but <laughs> I love a fanfic that is that can only exist as a fanfic because it is it, it only makes sense when it's in dialogue with the canon. Um, and I, I feel like that kind of fanfic really, really just, I love it because if you haven't read the canon, then the original, uh, then the fan fiction doesn't make sense. And it's just something very interesting that you can do. In terms of like the voices and the marginalized voices, I do agree that fan fiction um, allows a lot of people who may not be comfortable uh, being out in, in their real life, um, explore things. Um, and that's a super important thing that fan fiction allows you to do. The forcing outing that's been happening in traditional publishing is so terrible almost exclusively almost seems to be happening a lot with like bisexual writers and it's it's very very sad um very upsetting a lot of people don't realize that um there are countries out there that are so homophobic to the point where it's like literally illegal to uh be out um i live in one such country so it is actually really important to allow people to kind of maintain a distance between what they write and what their private life might be and I, I wish traditional publishing was more respectful of that distance. And, you know, I wish writers, especially minority writers, were not forced to out themselves when they may not be ready. And outing themselves could have consequences um, that range from, you know, just death threats to, you know, losing their jobs. Uh, these are very harsh and terrible realities um, outside of the Western world. So, um, and even within the Western world, because, you know, now like just transphobia is out of control in a lot of places. Um, so yeah, I, I wish I wish traditional publishers were more mindful of that. Um, I do want to say that I think fan fiction does have some issues with marginal voices in that it hasn't always been, fan, fan spaces hasn't always been the most, um, most open to um, POC writers. And um, I think sometimes uh, these, P- POC fans such as myself um, can feel um, not necessarily welcome. Um, and that's 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 something I think like fandom can work on just being more open to writers of color uh, who want to explore those spaces and fans of color as well. Uh, yeah, there, there's a racism problem in a lot of fandoms. And I think that's, that, that's an issue that fandoms have to reckon with, um, yeah. Star Wars. 
Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> just like one shot, one pill. Just to, uh, yeah, just to put it out there. Um, everybody said things that were 100% correct and things that I was going to say or touch on. So um, what I will say is that one thing that I've seen a lot of recently that you never see in traditional publishing for, for various reasons is the, the U fix. So they're written with a character insert, your name, your eye color, your hair color, and it's all, you know, you are the character in the story and it is written for you to insert yourself in as you're reading, um, which I think is a lot of fun. Um, not really my favorite category of fic, but I do think it's a, it, it definitely serves a, a very particular niche. And I think that a lot of people um, really, really enjoy uh, getting to put themselves in that role and, and really be a part of the stories that they love. Um, so that is something that you don't really see at all in, although you, there are very limited uh, second person stories, usually short stories um, out there in the traditional publishing world, but it's, it's different in a lot of ways too. It, it's more like a, a telling than a experience. I, I, I feel like personally, but, um, but yeah, that's something that's, that's uh, very cool. Um, I do think that um, Quilful touched on as somebody who is a, a, a triple threat, um, LGBTQ, disabled, uh, neurodivergent. Um, <laughs> there's so much of that in the fanfic world, and you don't get to see that it, uh, as often or as joyfully explored um, in the traditional publishing world because there is a lot of and and this happens with people of color as well. There is a lot of tragic tales of the you know the different person and how they have what they have to experience and okay. Um, but you don't get a lot of um, these joy joyfully autistic characters or you know people who are totally comfortable in their skin and that's just something about them, like any other thing. Um, or and particularly trans characters um, are much more joyfully explored in fanfic than we get to see or in more than like a handful of books that are traditionally published. So it is really fun to get to as, and as a reader, uh, not just from the perspective of, of the writer creating, but as a reader to get to see those characters explored and under grow an understanding because that's why we read right we even the things that aren't common with us we read from that character's point of view we learn things and um that you know that lovely windows and doors analogy uh, about getting to to see other people other than us and also get to getting to explore people who are like us that we don't necessarily see other people often that are like us. Um, it's just a really great way to enjoy that in without the, the limitations of, but will it sell? Um, because it will, but they, they don't realize it. Yeah, we're working on it, right? <laughs> Everyone raised uh, amazing points on every single question. Uh, we've uh, gone through all of our uh, allotted time, though, and even though I have more I would love to ask. I've gone through only half the page, and there's more I would love to ask all of you, but I want to respect everyone's time. So uh, I just want to thank uh, all of you for uh, for joining us and, and, and making this panel happen. It's been an absolute delight, honestly. We've had a lot of good thoughts and exchanges here, a lot of great things that were mentioned, um, touching on what Justine and Moniza said, uh, or at least endorsed with. Uh, there's a lot of hashtags out there that just end in joy, and you can just put whatever marginalized community you want in front of it. Black joy, trans joy, gay joy, ace joy. There's probably two posts in ace joy, but we're only like 1% of the last the population based on the last study, so, you know. Okay, but like, our <laughs> You say we're only 1% of the population, but I think we're like at least over 50% of this panel. So <laughs> yeah, but basically, yeah. Um, also, that last study was done in like the 90s. Checking so off those 
census, how many people are being a hundred percent honest on those things? Like, right. And again, like if you're like Monisa like, said, how many people can exactly. Right? So it's, or like, even what? has have tapped into, I mean, the, the, the information that's out there on, yeah. you know, and this study was like in the nineties in the UK, it wasn't even worldwide. So why right. do I know it off so the top of my head? Really... I refuse to answer. Um, <laughs> how many people are going to answer a census question, honestly, when their mom is in the background, be like, who's at the door? Yeah, you're exactly. like, uh, no, you can't, you can't. Uh, and some people, like I said, like there's the information out there about asexuality. It was so limited and it, we're just oh, starting yeah. to like understand oh, yeah. or like actually openly discuss these sorts of things that the chances that people were filling out things or even realized that they were. Yeah. No, and the, someone oh, pointed out demisexuality to me. I was like, I am a demigoddess. Thank you. Well, and the, the chance that someone would come across an identity, an idea, anything in fiction before they ever come across it on a census question where, yeah, let me whip out my phone and look up what this word means. No. Yeah. Well, um, I, if you thought I wasn't going to take this opportunity uh, to specifically promote the book that Moniza has in uh, her uh, background there, uh, you would be wrong. Um, being a... <laughs> A uh, anthology of ace fiction is coming from Page Street Publishing this fall, and it features both me and Boniza, so you should okay, buy thank, it. Thank you for picking up what I was putting down. Thank you. Like, the moment uh, I saw that, I was like, I am going to make that comment, and at some point, I'm going to get this in the door. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this was a this was a great panel. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to say the words Omegaverse so many times. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like there's no better way to end it is on that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, for anyone who's uh, Googling it while watching this, let's just yeah. go ahead and just tell them what Omegaverse is. Who, who wants to tackle that? I just think they should Google it. They should I Google should it. Google they it should experience it. I think they should Google it, it. it, in, in it safely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Go to Without a safe place where no one's you. looking over your shoulder. Then you can Google this. Okay. Maybe use I a private browser. browsing tab. Private browsing yep. tab. Message me if you really want to know. I'll explain yeah. it. I even yeah. made a really bad like fraternity tank top with ABO on That's it. That's so funny. Yeah. This um, is your I dangerous click of the day. This summer. Yes. <laughs> you, who knows how many you'll have by the time you're done with these panels, but this is <laughs> one of them. I am not the person to ask the definition of. I would, I would just sort of, I've maybe read like two. I just know what it is. <laughs> yeah, we're me too. Uh, I think all I know is the the uh, unfortunate uh, legal uh, issue that arose from it. Oh. I, I've heard of that. Yeah, it was. It's an incredible, uh, incredible situation. If you're going to Google it, you might as well Google the uh, lawsuit that happened. Also, <laughs> oh my god! I love that lawyers had to learn about Omega first. It's my favorite thing. My favorite yeah. thing. That and the yeah. Naruto. Trying run. to imagine, then, like yes. that the government Naruto officials run. have to know about Omega verse and the Naruto run. That's awesome. And in the that meantime, they're a... like, does TikTok connect to my Wi-Fi? <laughs> we're all gonna oh, we're all gonna get off this panel and our TikToks and our Instagrams are gonna be like, and here's some Omegaverse content for you. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you all again. I really appreciate uh, all of you giving us your your time and your expertise and your and your many wonderful written words. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>